Oh, the door is shut. Are we ready? Or do I need to wait a moment? I think he's talking to you guys. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming to my talk, Fuzzing Basics uh, or How to Break Software. And by the way, that is me on a really bad day. So just one of those. I'm Grid or Scott. I'll answer either one, whichever. I'm a husband. My wife's in the back. So if you see her, be nice to her. Uh, I'm an avid scuba diver, so if you're a diver and uh, you know some good scuba spots, hit me up. Um, I'm a hacker and breaker of software, but like I tell my boss, I only use my powers for good and not for evil most of the time. Uh, and I'm a security worker bee at Company X. My boss had asked me not to divulge where I work, just so I don't embarrass him. Uh, Does it work? What's that? Does it work? Yeah, some of the times. Uh, okay, uh, agenda, uh, yeah, like why fuzz? Uh, I'm going to show you uh, some uh, fuzzing methods, types of fuzzing, some fuzzing software. I've got lots of examples and samples, and those will be on uh, my GitHub page that you see there. I'm going to try to get them up there before the end of the con, uh, but uh, not certain of that, but they will go up there right after, if nothing else. Uh, some tips and tricks regarding fuzzing, and then uh, leave some time for some questions and uh, comments. Okay, uh, starting off. First of all, don't be this guy. Uh, don't test your code in production, but, you know, that doesn't always work. I've done it before. But uh, why fuzz? It's fun to break software. Um, I was a programmer for a very long time, so uh, honestly, it's more fun to break things than it is to build them. Uh, finding exploitable bugs is really fun. Uh, anybody out there do exploit dev? A few people? Yeah, well, you got to do fuzzing to find the exploits. I've done a couple of exploits just for work-related use that have been really simple, so I am very much a beginner at that. Um, more thorough testing. Uh, generally, when you fuzz, you can get input that users or programmers often don't consider or can't make, like... Uh, a lot of encoded stuff or passing nulls and that sort of thing. Uh, fuzzing definitely helps increase your software quality, but in my mind the most important reason to fuzz is it helps hold your vendors accountable for poorly written and poorly tested code. I can't count the number of times that I've done fuzz testing on something that uh, my company has bought and it's just totally fallen apart. So, And then you get back with the vendor and you say, hey, can you fix this? They say, well, why did you pass that in the first place to the input? It's only supposed to take, you know, one through nine. It's like, well, okay, <laughs> test your crap. Nobody would do that, though. <laughs> yeah, no regular exactly. No, but no regular user would do that. Uh, okay, fuzzing methods. Uh, basically, I kind of boil it down to three. There's manual, where you just put stuff in yourself. Uh, automated, using a fuzzing software, writing your own fuzzer. And... Uh, I threw the wireless in there because I've messed a little bit with MDK3 and Kali, uh, but not much more than that. It is kind of interesting, though, so that's something I want to put on my to-do list. Uh, types of fuzzing, uh, basically I see it as just two, local and remote. Local being fuzzing something that you've got on your own machine. Uh, as far as I know, you've pretty much got to do that for exploit development. Uh, and gives you full control of the environment, so you've got you got everything in one spot. Remote fuzzing, something that's installed elsewhere, like a web application. A lot of what I deal with is web applications, uh, but it's more restricted in terms of control. Um, ideally, if you can get to or look at the server while you're doing your fuzzing. Uh, for instance, if I'm fuzz testing a uh, web application that one of our developers did. Uh, you can get pretty immediate feedback on how it's going based on how the server is responding or not responding. Um, but the downside to that is routers, switches, firewalls, stuff sitting in between can uh, be kind of problematic depending on how they're tuned. Uh, so something to uh, holler at your network guys about. Uh, software, basically anything allowing interaction with your target can be considered a fuzzer. Uh, for Windows, the two that I have used, uh, Peach Fuzzer, the uh, public edition, the community edition, I know they have a professional edition. I've not used it, but I've watched some of the videos on it, and it looks pretty decent. 
um, perp suite uh, for uh, fuzzing on windows. Um, I mostly use Cali, uh, Burp Suite, Bed, Duna, Dot Dot Pollen, those other ones that you see. Um, Spike and a Wasp Zap. Um, the Nmap fuzzer scripts are pretty decent. Uh, in terms of fuzzing on Windows, Peach Fuzzer, the community.peachfuzzer.com is a good website. They've got all kinds of good tutorials there. Um, the uh, the peach pits, the fuzz definitions are done in XML, so having a good XML as, head, as a XML editor, excuse me, is helpful, but it's not required. Uh, the XML for the peach pits isn't particularly complex, but um, having a good editor will let you kind of grid stuff out properly so you can follow it well. Uh, there are a number of uh, peach pits available on the internet. Uh, when you install the peach fuzzer, they've got a samples. Uh, folder that's got some good templates and stuff in there. Uh, Peach has good feedback on uh, reproducing crashes and logging info, and I've got some examples of that uh, in a bit. The, uh, like I said, the tutorials are really good. I'd highly recommend working through those. If you've never worked with Peach Fuzzer before, those tutorials will really bring you up to speed quickly on Peach. Uh, and that link at the bottom uh, is essentially a collection of other links that a uh, user on the Peach forums posted uh, listing various different resources that you can go to uh, bone up on fuzzing and kind of get your feet wet, so to speak. Uh, the, I can't think of the guy's <coughs> name, but he posted a number of different links for beginner, intermediate, and advanced fuzzing, so it's really helpful. I, I refer to it regularly myself just to kind of refresh my memory. Uh, there are some gotchas with the community edition of Peach Fuzzer. I reported these bugs a while ago and essentially got back a response saying, well, we're more interested in our paid products, so we'll get to this eventually. Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, no big deal, really. You, uh, these mutators uh, are simply misspelled, so if you spell them correctly, they won't work properly, so you have to misspell them there. Uh, not all of the samples on Peach work out of the box, and uh, those Peach pits can be tough to write and debug, so when you're getting started with Peach, uh, you definitely want to stick with something simple first and then kind of expand on it from there. Um, it's not too hard to make a Peach pit for uh, HTTP traffic since the HTTP specification is fairly simple, so it's not too difficult to do one of those. Um, and as I was working through one of the tutorials, I found out that this particular mutator can kill Windows uh, when you're fuzzing WAV files. Uh, so depending on what you're doing, what you're fuzzing, you may want to exclude certain mutators, and I'll have an example of that. Uh, some tips on running Peach. Uh, you just run, run Peach at the command line, and it just gives you a list of all of its options. Uh, Peach minus T will validate your Peach pit. Um, doing a minus one will just sample run it, but not apply any mutators to it. It'll just run it with the data that you give it, and then it does its thing. So you can see how it works, how it calls your target program, and then assuming you pass the correct data through the peach pit, your target program will return what it's supposed to return if you were to give it valid input. Uh, peach minus C will give you a count of the test iterations, uh, which will let you know how long it may take. Uh, Peach minus P will let you run Peach Fuzzer in parallel, but it doesn't do any networking. It just divides the number of test iterations by the machine. So with some simple math I put there, uh, if you have 30,000 test iterations, it's just going to divide it in thirds on each machine. So um, especially when you get up into the areas, like if you're fuzzing HTTP, for instance, and you've got a big request that has a lot of request headers, you may want to split it among multiple machines so your fuzzing will finish faster. And you can quickly run into tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of iterations depending on the size of your HTTP request. Uh, okay, so uh, I built this peach pit from the online tutorial, and like I said, I apologize, you guys in the back may have difficulty seeing it, but I'm going to put this presentation as well as all of the samples and examples on GitHub afterwards so you can go through it. 
But basically, the way this breaks down is that the data model describes the data that Peach is going to consume. In this case, it's going to be a .png <coughs> file, so it's just defined as a blob. The state model defines how Peach is going to interact with it and then where it's going to pull its info from. So in this case, it's referring to this PNG. The, I've got the test data in this case loaded into the PNG test files folder. It's going to pull out every one of the .png files there, mutated in some way, either flipping bits or uh, messing with the metadata, whatever kind of mutators that you've applied to it. And then the uh, action type call is going to actually launch the process that you want to fuzz. In this case, it's the uh, MS Paint that you can see down in the agent area. So essentially what this is going to do is that it's going to launch Paint with the fuzz.png that is coming from this area. So it's going to pull a file, mutate it, rename it to fuzz.png, and then call MS Paint. Uh, Peach does require the Windows debugging tools. Uh, that, that's what the Win debug path there is for. The documentation says that you don't have to supply that, but Peach rarely can seem to find it, so I just spell it out uh, literally there. Uh, start on call just does the launch viewer, which then launches the uh, paint process. And then uh, CPU kill true. If the CPU spikes at 100% for a certain length of time, then Peach is going to kill that fuzzing session and then move on to the next one. Uh, the monitors that you see at the bottom, uh, in this case, I'm watching the heat. And on the next page here, okay, it's just the heat up there. Yeah, just watching the heat there. Uh, the publisher class says, okay, this is my fuzz input from my folder of files that where my PNG files are located. Uh, strategy class random, I'm going to randomly hop around through the various mutating cases. And the logger class is where I'm going to log output from the fuzz run. So if on the, say, the first time and it runs through and paint doesn't crash or do anything odd. It's just going to iterate a counter. Uh, when it does crash, then that's where things get more interesting. And Peach Law is really helpful, detailed info on how to uh, take your crash case and then weaponize it through an export. It gives you a, a uh, stack dump, uh, traces, and all that kind of good stuff. So a uh, pit to fuzz a command line that takes one program. Uh, Relatively similar, uh, in this case the data model is the name of the program I want to fuzz. Uh, the extract.exe, which was something that was built by one of our programmers. Um, the way this program worked was it took uh, parameters separated by spaces, so that's the reason for the space right after the extract.exe. Uh, I defined another data model with the parameter, which the first run through it's going to be uh, C colon backslash scans, so it outputs an extract to the scans folder. Uh, if we wanted to, uh, if we had a command line program that fuzz, that you wanted to fuzz that took more than one parameter, you would just define different data models, and I just called it arbitrarily parameter two, parameter three, so on and so forth. Uh, the state model in this case. What it does is it's going to build a batch file which then has extract.exe space parameter in it. Now I'm not really interested in fuzzing, in this case I wasn't interested in fuzzing anything but the parameter to the extract.exe program. That was why I laid out the data model and the state model the way it is and the tutorial goes into more in-depth stuff on this. Uh, but as before, if we had a command line program that took more than one parameter and you wanted to fuzz those parameters, you would define them in the state model uh, here, uh, output parameter 2, output parameter 3, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then the action near the bottom uh, where it's making a call to a run program method which actually runs the batch file. 
and uh, this fuzzing was taking place on a Windows machine, hence the Win agent. Uh, the command line, you can see that it actually calls is, it's going to call the call underscore program dot bat, which has my target program and then the parameter that I'm going to fuzz. The win debug path, uh, don't want to kill the CPU if it spikes at 100% in this case. And then depending on what you're fuzzing, you may or may not want to use for the wait for exit on call or wait for exit timeout, those you may want to leave, uh, I go back and forth on it. Sometimes I leave them as they are as the defaults just because that seems to work for me, but if you start getting weird results or your target program starts hanging, you may want to use one or both of those to let the program finish its process before it goes to the next fuzz case. Uh, so we're watching the uh, heap again. And this uh, little pop-up watcher here, if you have a program that has a pop-up that has to be responded to before going to the next case, Peach can handle that. If you give it the name uh, of the pop-up window, Peach will close it automatically, go to the next fuzz case, so you don't have to sit there and click and dismiss a window if you're going on a long fuzzing run, for instance. Pretty, pretty nifty stuff. So we're wrapping it up here in this test case. Uh, strategy class sequential, I'm going to go literally from one to the end of the test cases that Peach defines in the fuzzing run. Um, the publisher class here, the call underscore program dot bat that you see, uh, that is the actual container of, as I said, the extract.exe space and then the parameter of the fuzz. Uh, I'm writing logs to that area. You can write the logs anywhere. I just left it there at the default because that's where I liked it. And then excluding uh, mutators, depending on what you're fuzzing, you may not want to bother with fuzzing every single case, although that gives you the best fuzzing coverage. Um, it may chew up time that's going to give you unnecessary results or stuff that's not valid for what you're doing, so you can drop certain mutators. And like I said, there's a big list of all of the mutators on the Peach website that the uh, the Peach developers went through so you can see what the mutator does and then make a determination whether or not that's going to be useful for you in whatever program it is you're fuzzing. So you can drop them. Um, you notice there at the, near the bottom uh, the misspellings, so if you were to spell those two mutators correctly it would ignore them or Peach may throw an error when you try to run it. Uh, so I wanted to uh, make sure I had that in there. You included that, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they, they, don't, they don't tell you they're misspelled. That's right. They okay. don't tell you that. You have to actually try to run it spelled correctly, and then it dies, and then you wonder what's going on. Okay. Okay, so uh, logging. Oops. i got to jump out here for a second to show you this. The way Peach logs, uh, like I said, is helpful to let you know exactly what's going on. So... When it hits something that's an error, where the program throws an error and crashes, it says, okay, I can do it once, can I reproduce it? So, in the faults folder, and this will be, this will be a subfolder under wherever you've got peach logging. So if you've got peach logging to uh, my directory slash logs, then within that there will be a fault and then the specifics on what's going on. So you can see here we've got a memory address and it says exploitable. The 17821 was the specific test case that it died on. So within that, we've got an initial. So this was the first time fault, what it died on the first time. So in this case, there's my program. And then this was the parameter passed to the extract.exe that the extract.exe program died on. So Pete says, OK. It died once, and it wrote the uh, debugging stuff here. So then one level up, it says, okay, it died once. I'm going to try to reproduce it. You don't have to try to reproduce it uh, manually. Peach is going to try a second time with the exact same input to see if the program crashes a second time. So there's the extract.exe, and same string as before, what killed the program. 
And uh, so it says, okay, I was able to reproduce it. This is most likely a bug that I think is exploitable, and here's why. We got the Windows debug engine description, and it pulls this from the Windows debugging tools that you've got installed. So we've got a stack trace and all this good stuff here. And then near the bottom, uh, you can see bug title, user mode, right, access violation starting at this area. Uh, they're not near null, so it's exploitable. So something, if you're writing exploits, it's like, oh, okay, this is worth looking into here because I've got a reproducible crash that happened in the same way with the same string. And according to what the info here tells me, the debugging engine and all this good stuff, which, like I said, I am not an exploit developer yet by any means. But Peach logs all this stuff with the help of the Windows debugging engine, so you can, as an exploit developer, start the process of going through uh, writing your writing your uh, skeleton exploit and hopefully weaponizing it. Oops, actually I didn't really close that because there was something else. Uh, within, if you get a false positive, and Peach refers to something as false positive, if it can't reproduce it, you'll see something more like this, non-reproducible, and a <coughs> directory named unknown or unavailable or something like that, where Peach says, okay, I could crash it, but I couldn't make it crash a second time in a row, so I'm going to assume that that's not going to be something that's exploitable. Um, if you were doing exploit development, uh, these would probably drop to the bottom of your priority list just because they're not as likely to lead to remote code execution. But Peach logs its way around through the status text file, and it will tell you uh, iteration 100 of the total, iteration 200 of the total, so you can see along the way how far it's getting. So pretty nifty stuff. Let's just jump ahead a little bit. Ah, okay, it still didn't work. Bear with me. Okay, uh, switching gears to Burp Suite. Burp is not really a fuzzer per se, but uh, repeater is handy if you're doing manual fuzzing because you can uh, just simply grab the intercepted request, uh, the HTTP request dump it over to a repeater with a right click, and then twiddle with it however you want. I like to use it for manual fuzzing of web applications. Um, the coder and compare, depending on what you're doing, are pretty handy as far as unraveling Base64 and coding view state on uh, .NET apps, for instance. Uh, that's a little hard to see, but this particular um, application that I was dealing with had this image handler uh, item in it, and it took a query string parameter of an ID, so I put the, just as a marker to myself when I was stepping through it, where I wanted to insert my fuzz data, and then I wanted to try to fuzz the ASP.NET session ID cookie, so I marked that with a fuzz data. Like I said, that's, that's not a burp suite uh, function per se, but just a marker for me saying, okay, these are the areas that I want to uh, come back to after I've gone through the various points of the application. You consider using Intruder? What's that? Intruder? I have once or twice. I don't have the pro version of Burp Suite. I'm just using the, the free version. Uh, but I'm still working on trying to figure out my way around Burp Suite and then getting some, getting some funding to get the pro version of Burp. Okay, switching gears to uh, the Kali Linux stuff. BED, uh, the brute force exploit detector, it's uh, very vulnerable. I've uh, been around for uh, a long time. Anybody use BED? Anybody run it? Okay. Uh, it's a network protocol function. They've got uh, modules for uh, FTP, SMTP, HTTP, several others. There, it has a set list of strings for fuzzing, so it doesn't do mutation like um, Peach does. 
Uh, you can add your own strings by changing the code. It's Perl and it's pretty easy to uh, to follow. Uh, it's a general use fuzzer. You kind of fire it off and forget it. Uh, depending on what you're doing, you might want to mod some of the modules to pass in specific things. Um, I've used it a lot for HTTP. Like I said, I deal a lot with web applications. So, uh, and HTTP being a fairly simple uh, protocol, you can uh, mod the bed modules however you like. Um, BED does not have very good feedback in terms of what caused the crash, so I'll start up Wireshark or T-Shark or something like that so I can get a packet capture going so I can see exactly what goes on if I get a crash. Uh, these are the fuzz, fuzz strings that uh, BED uses. BED was designed and developed primarily to fuzz C applications, so there's a lot of C-related stuff there, the format strings for uh, C. Uh, there you may recognize along with the Unicode stuff uh, and uh, large numbers. So stuff, these were items that uh, the developers put in that um, often cause crashes or at least instability in programs. Uh, Duna, uh, it's a uh, expansion and a fork of BED. Uh, same as BED really, a network protocol fuzzer. It has a more comprehensive list of fuzz strings, so uh, it's more likely to crash stuff simply because it's got a bigger payload to draw from. Uh, also written in Perl, so uh, you can add your own fuzz strings, remove, depending on your needs. Uh, it's fire and forget, uh, so you just kind of kick it off and then wait for it to uh, run. Uh, just like with bed, uh, I always start packet capture before using it so I get better visibility into what causes a crash. Uh, the fuzz strings you can see here are, there's a few more, um, specifically the uh, format strings <coughs> near the bottom. There's some more interesting looking format strings, uh, a few more large numbers, uh, some uh, different miscellaneous strings that you can see there. So it's a little more comprehensive. But depending on what you're doing, you might use BED, you might use Duna, you might use both. So, you know, you always pick the tool that works best for you. Uh, dot dot poem, uh, it's good for finding directory traversal stuff. It's got a huge list of various ways to do dot dot slash, so it works really good for that. Uh, I had to edit the uh, Perl module there, the traversal engine.pm, to look for specific target files I was looking to find in a directory traversal. Uh, so depending on what you're doing, the default out-of-the-box install that uh, comes with Kali may work for you or you may need to modify it. Um, I've found it's best to run dot dot pwn after you're doing a fair amount of recon. Dot dot pwn will run without any of the special uh, options and uh, stuff that you can pass to it, but if you can tell dot dot pwn what uh, platform it's on, then it's going to run a whole lot better and it'll cut out all kinds of stuff that you won't need. Like if you're fuzzing a Windows box, for instance, you don't need to have it look for the Etsy password or the Etsy shadow, that sort of stuff. Uh, the uh, E and dash X uh, parameters uh, will help intensify your uh, directory traversal attacks, so those are good to use. And if you're using it on a web server, uh, don't forget the uh, minus M parameter to switch HTTP methods between get and post. And uh, it's a screenshot of some of the dot dot uh, stuff. The uh, the third grouping down, the extra files, that's where uh, you can uh, change or modify as you see fit depending on what target files you're looking for. And uh, you can see there near the middle of the screen the uh, representations of the dots and the slashes that dot dot pwn will cycle through to try to get directly to the first on the target that you pointed it at. Will it also try other HTTP methods? Not on its own. You have to tell it to via that dash m parameter. If you don't give it the dash m parameter, uh, it's going to delete or something like that. You would. Uh, well, the question was, uh, will it do different uh, dot dot pwn do different uh, HTTP methods? You would have to describe those on the uh, parameters uh, dash m post. Uh, I think they're comma separated, so you would do 
dash m uh, post update put delete whatever other methods you want to use. Uh, the Metasploit has some good fuzzer modules. Has anybody messed around with the uh, fuzzer modules in Metasploit? Anybody know about them? They're not particularly, oh, I see a couple of hands go up. They're not particularly well advertised in Metasploit. I'm not really sure why. They're good. Uh, they're uh, fuzzers for uh, DNS, SMTP, uh, HTTP, a few other protocols. Uh, that path that you see there on the screen is uh, pointed toward, uh, that's where you can see all the fuzzers that are available, or you can just do a search fuzzer within the MSF console to pull them up. I've had good luck with uh, SMB and HTTP fuzzers. I haven't really used many beyond that. Uh, so far, I haven't had a need. Um, most of the modules, the fuzzer modules, I think, support the threads parameter, so you can bump that up and finish your fuzzing a bit faster. And uh, the Metasploit fuzzer modules provide some pretty good feedback on what causes a crash, uh, but I still want a packet capture just so I've got all the data I need. Um, that big, long, ugly path there to fuzzer.rb is the uh, Ruby code for how fuzz strings are created, and that's worthwhile to look at. You don't have to know Ruby to interpret this, even if you've only done just a tiny bit of programming. If you look at it and run down through it, it'll make sense, and you can see how the Metasploit builds the fuzzer, uh, the fuzz string. So it's a pretty good reference. Uh, the TDS login corrupt and TDS login username are good for fuzzing uh, SQL Server. The code is a bit dated now. You might have to edit it to send the correct TDS version for SQL Server. I think the um, I think the modules send a uh, the TDS version for SQL Server 2000, which hopefully nobody's still running SQL Server 2000. Would anybody admit to it if they were? Uh, I know I wouldn't. Um, but uh, those two links there uh, to uh, Microsoft's website uh, define where the TDS version is and specifically how to structure it so you can go in and change the Ruby code to point it to the right TDS version. Um, within Metasploit, the, uh, those three fuzzer modules, HTTP form field, get URI long, get URI strings, those are good. Uh, the SMB2 negotiate corrupt is uh, good. It sends... Uh, bad negotiation packets via SMB2, and uh, that can cause some interesting crashes. Uh, the Nmap fuzzer scripts, uh, nmap.org slash doc has good documentation on all Nmap scripts, not just the fuzzing ones. Uh, they've got a DNS fuzz one. I've not used it yet, um, but I have used the HTTP form fuzzer. It will go through and scrape the fields on a form and then fuzz each one, so it's it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good for just kicking it off and just letting it go and watch what it's doing. Um, I don't work with PHP code myself, but uh, there is a PHP fuzzer there, uh, but it looks pretty interesting just glancing through the code. I've not written a line of code in Lua, but uh, it looks fairly self-explanatory. Um, you can find all the scripts for Nmap in the user share Nmap scripts directory. So if you're up on Lua or want to do some modding, they're all there for you. Uh, Spike. Uh, Spike's been around for a, a long time. Uh, tough to use, but uh, pretty powerful. I don't know C that well, but the better you know C, the more mileage you can get out of Spike. Uh, there's a really good tutorial on it at uh, the InfoSecInstitute.com, and that's where I started learning more about Spike. Uh, Cali comes with uh, some pre-built spikes in that area that are useful, but nine times out of ten you're going to have to modify them for your particular target. Um, there are two basic commands. I think there's more, but there's only two that I've ever used in spike. The generic send TCP and generic send UDP. They send TCP and UDP packets respectively. Uh, that's IPv4. It doesn't, as far as I know, spike doesn't support IPv6. Um, it's got some admittedly weak documentation uh, in the user share doc spike, uh, but the best way to learn spike and to really know what it does, assuming you've got a reasonable knowledge of C, is to just look at the code. 
Uh, you can search the spike.c for the init fuzz ints and then look for fuzz string and you'll see the fuzz strings that are used. Kali does not come with a spike source, so you've got to pull it from somewhere else. The last time I looked, it was at fuzzing.org. There was a spike file link there. Um, Kali only has the um, compiled version of spike, so you can't actually see what it's doing if you're interested in modding spike or looking to see what kind of fuzz strings it's uh, using. You'll have to pull a copy of the source from uh, that area. It may exist elsewhere, but when I just did a quick Google search, that was the first thing that came up. Okay, a spike for fuzzing HTTP get. Um, like I said, you don't have to have a good uh, knowledge of um, C, but the more you know about it, the more use you can make a spike. Uh, basically, uh, you just lay out your uh, HTTP request and then separate it with a carriage return line feed. So in this case, the, uh, the S string is a constant. That won't change. When you use S string variable, it will pass that the first time on the first run of the spike, and then for the subsequent runs, it's going to replace that with its fuzz string. Uh, another one, uh, in this one, uh, I'm wanting to fuzz the value of the query string TID, so that's why I broke the get up into two lines so I can see clearly, okay, this is the spot I wanted to insert my fuzz string. Um, the fuzzing the web resource.axd, if you're on .NET, it's always a good idea to fuzz that when you're testing uh, applications. And I wanted to, in this case, test the D query string. Uh, and I didn't care about breaking up the T query string, testing that separately at the time, which you could just by busting the line up into multiples and then putting the S string underscore variable in the spot where you wanted to insert your fuzz string. Uh, okay, fuzzing post. The neat thing about Spike is it will calculate the correct content length if you're fuzzing a post request, but you've got to do it within a specific block. That's the reason for the insertion of that S block size string. I know that's near the bottom. Uh, but uh, like I said, I'm going to put this online so you'll be able to see it. So as long as you define the, uh, in this case, the body of the post that I wanted to fuzz, the view state in this .NET application within a block, then every time Spike iterates through and it grabs a new fuzz string, it's going to recalculate the content length. So it's going to pass it over correctly and the web server, the receiving web server won't just reject it out of hand with an HTTP error code that the content length is wrong, which is kind of cool. Okay, uh, Peach Fuzzer on Kali works pretty much the same as Windows. You've got to get the mono packages if you're on a Ubuntu or Debian distro. You can just do an install mono complete with the app get. Um, let's see, I'm running a little short on time here. Uh, so some general tips and tricks. Uh, mess around with your target first. Get an idea about what it uh, what it does, how it works, before you launch a fuzzing run against it. This will let you tailor your fuzzing to your target. Uh, knowing what input the program expects will let you know what it doesn't expect and will kind of lead you to the third thing there uh, to ask yourself, what are the best or worst inputs that I can, call, that I can pass that will cause damage? Uh, you know, as I'm sure we've all written some code before. Programmers code for certain types of bad input, but it's almost impossible to catch everything because most programmers don't do whitelisting of input. They'll have a uh, have a block that says, "Okay, I want to reject a uh, alphanumeric uh, or an alphabetic and a numeric field, for instance." But they may not do bounce checking, length checking, or stuff like that. Uh, so try mixing special characters and spaces, carriage returns and line feeds and stuff uh, when you create your fuzz strings just to see what the program does. Uh, for .NET, like I said, I work a lot with uh, web applications, .NET stuff in particular. Um, try passing format strings to a .NET input like the, the uh, 0N2 or the date formatting string just to see if, the, uh, if your target program blows up. Um, Using virtual machine software, VMware or Oracle VirtualBox might be helpful when you're doing fuzzing. 
Uh, same thing goes for spare hardware. Use it for fuzzing practice. Uh, you know, if you've got some old wireless routers or access points hanging around, you know, break out MDK3 and play around with it. Uh, it's disruptive by nature. Be prepared to reboot your target. Um, I found this out the hard way when I was starting out that I didn't let the network admins know, and all of a sudden they started seeing this crazy traffic going through a uh, web server, and they said, oh man, we're under attack. No, 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 it's just me. I screwed up. I forgot to let you know. Um, the dev.modern.ie has some free time-limited virtual machines that are good for fuzzing targets. That's a Microsoft site. Uh, you can get a variety of different uh, VMs, I think VirtualBox too, uh, with different operating systems on them and different uh, versions of Internet Explorer, so you've got a pretty good resource there. Uh, Vulnhub.com has some good challenges with downloadable virtual machines, not specifically fuzzing related, but uh, good resources nonetheless. And uh, the Exploit DB has a couple of good write-ups there on uh, fuzzing, and I review those periodically just to kind of refresh my memory and see if I can learn something new. Uh, start with a short fuzzing run at first to make sure that uh, everything is good. Just a few iterations to make sure that the program, your target program is responding or not responding as the case may be to see what's happening. Make sure you're getting feedback from your fuzzer that's uh, useful for you, like a packet capture or logging or something like that. Uh, stuff for Windows, simulate production as closely as possible so your fuzzing run will be as accurate as you can make it. Uh, I put that in there about watching for antivirus and anti-malware, including Emmet. Um, I have not yet seen antivirus or anti-malware or Emmet catch a fuzzing run. Um, I don't know if that's by design or what, but I stuck that in there anyway just to kind of, you know, if you see odd things happening or uh, something that you're not expecting, see if maybe the anti-malware or the, if you're running Microsoft Emmet is tripping you up. Uh, Especially on Windows, you tend to run your target out of memory, particularly if you're using Peach. I don't know if that's because of a memory leak in Peach or just the way Peach works. Uh, and uh, Control-Alt-Delete is your friend on your target. Uh, some tips with Kali, and this is just, you know, your mileage may vary, but I usually start with the general purpose fuzzers like Bad or Duna and then progress to the other ones I needed. Uh, Depends on what I'm fuzzing, though. That method works well for me with web applications. Um, ben and Duna are currently having some problems. The, um, the last time I did a app get uh, update and disk upgrade on Kali, it pushed Perl to a new version there, 52225, <coughs> and that broke Bed, Duna, and I think it broke Uniscan. Uh, but I got in touch with the Duna, Duna developer, uh, so shout out to WireGool on that. He was very helpful to provide a fix, and I backported that to bed, and that worked there. And I reported this on the uh, Cali Bugs page, and I think it was yesterday I got a response from one of the Cali devs that they're going to push this into the repos, but I don't know if it was going to go out this week, next, or even in another version. But the there is a fix in place for bed and Duna. Uh, but uh, you just have to do a, uh, an app get and you know, see when it comes down. The, uh, I've got the, that link there has the fixes in it, so if you need better Duna and the fixes haven't been pushed to the Cali repos, then you can apply the fixes yourself. It's just a handful of lines of code. Uh, no big deal there. But uh, check the fuzzer source to make sure it's sending the strings you want. Uh, you might need to customize them based on your target. So if you're working on, for instance, a uh, Apache box, uh, you wouldn't want to send .NET-based fuzz strings to it. Or maybe you would, depending on you know uh, what's going on and what your program is. Uh, start a packet capture before you begin your fuzzing run. Uh, some tools don't give good feedback, so especially if you're doing exploit development, uh, you want to know exactly what's going on over the wire when you do your requests and get your response. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it for me. I'll have the samples up at uh, my GitHub page there. I had to add some extra Ds because the grid with one D was already taken, unfortunately. <laughs> um, 
But uh, make fuzzing part of your development or QA process. It does help, but you know it's going to drive your programmers nuts. Uh, that's okay; they'll get over it. Uh, but uh, I'll be around. Stop and introduce yourself if you want. And my email address there: diverdown10 at gmail.com. You can uh, reach out to me. I've got a, maybe about five minutes. Anybody have any questions, comments? Yes. Have you ever had to use anything that goes through the front end uh, that will run through like, a browser or a physical application uh, doing sentence type of crap? Not yet, and... Can you repeat the question? Think, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, have you ever had to send anything through a front end using uh, send keys or anything like that? Or Selenium or something. Yeah, to something Selenium something. or something like that. I haven't yet, but it looks interesting. It's something that I want to put on my to-do list based on, based on the yeah. program. I've got some stuff in the pipeline where I have to do some fuzzing on Windows-based applications, so I think that's where that's going to come in, but I haven't done it yet. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, have you tried, uh, you were talking about one of the topic and Wireshark and stuff, uh, to see traffic. Have you ever tried something like D D trace on Unix like systems systems to see what the file system is doing or what the network's doing? Uh, i I think I used D trace some time ago, but I haven't recently, so my memory's a little rusty on that, but that might be a good tool to kind of watch, keep watch on things. Okay, thanks, appreciate the tip. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay, that's it, thanks for coming.